wonderful and well-known uh, teachings of the Dalai Lama, something very regularly that he says is that my religion is kindness. And when people hear that, it resonates because there's something in us that senses beyond any particular uh, philosophy or religion or way of thinking. If we just dedicated our lives to kindness, if that was it, if we just, that, that quality of friendliness and care, if we just dedicated our, our lives to that, there really would be no need for uh, so much of the, the ideas of the codes and the guidelines and the religions. What a world. Many of you have heard me talk about my favorite bumper sticker, which is, if you lived in your heart, you'd be home right now. <laughs> and people, when they hear it, they smile and go, yeah. It's partly because we know that that in the moments that we're really feeling our hearts, that feels like we're most living in who we are. We're home. And it's such a, it's such a sweet experience. So what I'd like to do tonight, and it's going to be tonight in the next three classes, is explore what in Buddhism is called the Brahma Viharas, and that means the divine abodes. And the Brahma Viharas are really the expressions of freedom that come when we're awake. Uh, and they come in the form of loving kindness, of compassion, of joy. And that includes sympathetic joy, joy for the joy of others. And equanimity. And equanimity is that quality of balance and wisdom that actually makes possible true love, compassion, and joy. So now you know the map for the next uh, four weeks of... Actually, next week I won't be here, but the week after that and then the two following. So we begin with loving kindness. And we might call it love or loving kindness. There's different words. But what I'd actually like to do as, is first to say that love and every one of these expressions are innate to us. They belong to these hearts and minds. They're part of us. And we can either uh, stay in our habitual conditioning and have them be somewhat latent and somewhat expressed, or as we wake up, become more intentional about having them flourish. So we're just going to be exploring through these weeks that intentionality, how we can become more purposeful about having these innate capacities really expressed so we live from them. They actually um, express our beingness through our day in the small ways, like in traffic. <laughs> or like in the middle of an argument, there's something in us that wakes up. Or in the way we eat, or the way we do dishes or take showers what Blake called the minute particulars. So I'd like to begin with a reflection, just to have you check in as to what these words mean to you. So we're not living in some abstract plane here. And the reflection is quite simple. When I say the words loving kindness or unconditional loving, what is that for you? If, you? if you bring to mind a person in your life who's easy to love, and you think of a, a recent moment when you were with that person, when you felt fully your love, in the sense of there's a quality of being embodied, that love has that sense of it's in your body, there's a warmth, an openness a tenderness, an appreciation, a sense of appreciation. Just sense if some of those are there, what is it for you? 
when you're feeling love or loving kindness. Some people talk about it as non-separation, as sensing the oneness that we share. What is it for you? Opening your eyes, and, and this will be a, a continued reflection because we'll be doing through, through this evening um, different uh, re- pieces of the metta or loving-kindness practice. The Pali word metta is the word for loving-kindness, but another translation is friendliness, which I think is a beautiful translation too. Okay, so when I had you reflect For some of you, you might have felt this whole-bodied feeling and the warmth and the tenderness, and others might have heard those words and they might have just, you might have just glazed over at them. The reason? For many of us, most of the time, our love is somewhat abstract. We'll think of somebody and go, yeah, I love that person. But it's not an embodied love. Do you know what I mean by that? Is that? Okay, good. Make sure we're here together. So there's gradations. Sometimes we're more present and it really, there's, we're inhabiting it. That awake, tender space within us is is vibrant. But a lot of the time we're somewhat disconnected from it. So one of the promises and invitations of spiritual traditions and Buddhism in particular is that we have this capacity to wake that up in us. That there are ways that we can train our attention so that we actually feel that, uh, that sense of tenderness in, in a visceral way. And we actually have the most recently evolved parts of our brain, you know, the frontal cortex, actually has the structures that are there to feel empathy and feel compassion and feel bonding. We have the mirror neurons that help us really feel that kind of I understand where you're at feeling. We have uh, the oxytocin that lets us feel that sense of really belonging and bonding. It's, It's in our brains to feel those experiences. So it's really part of our, the evolution of consciousness that we can experience love. In fact, it's part of our survival. So when we begin um, the exploration of humans, we find that we can either cultivate it or it gets overridden. And there's many, many studies now that show the power of training attention, Um, whether it's through mindfulness or through the loving kindness practice or compassion practice that literally stimulates the parts of the brain that are correlated with what I just described, empathy and compassion and so on. So what blocks us? You know, what stops us from living from those qualities? Um, what I'll, the language I'll use tonight is uh, one that's familiar to some of you what stops us is that we spend many moments of our life in a trance and in that trance there's an experience of separateness and generally not okayness, that something's wrong. And that separateness and not okayness uh, comes with emotions of fear and anger. So, you might be feeling anxious or annoyed and around your child or around your partner and you know you love that person but it's blocked, right, in those moments. Well, that happens a lot. We're anxious a lot. I mean, many moments of the day there's something in us that says there's not enough time. Is that familiar to you? The sense there's not enough time? And so there's this anxiety that we won't get enough done to be okay and in some way we'll fail and it can come with a real sense, not just fail in a job, but something real, there'll be bad consequences. So our bodies living with that, we're not available 
for loving kindness in those moments. It's that the limbic system, the parts of our brain, the lower parts of our brain, the earlier, more primitive evolved parts of our brain, are overriding the parts of our brain that need to be activated for love. And I'm not going to spend the whole night going back to the brain and science, especially because I'm not, uh, it's, it's still vague in me, but I think it's really interesting that we have this capacity, it's built in, and it gets overridden, okay? So, we know that to be loving, we need to be present. To be loving, we need to be present. And yet, as we begin to practice here with the meditation, we sense just how much conditioning there is to pull us away from what's happening here, to have us react to what's happening here, but not to inhabit the moment. A crow was sitting on a tree doing nothing all day. A small rabbit saw the crow and asked him, can I also sit like you and do nothing all day long? (laughs) The crow answered, sure, why not? So the rabbit sat on the ground below the crow and rested. All of a sudden a fox appeared, jumped on the rabbit and ate it. (laughs) Lesson, our insight from that, To be sitting and doing nothing, you must be sitting very, very high up. (laughs) So survival emotions are there for a good reason, in case you thought I was putting down the limbic system. We need them. (laughs) I mean, we really do. It's a universal wiring to, um, you know, to scan and be vigilant and sense when there's danger and sense if we're with someone we can't trust what we're not going to be saying or doing. And... um, to to look out. We have to. We've had to through the eons. Um, And depending on our biology and our culture, sometimes that's revved up very high, very activated, the fight-flight response, and sometimes not as high. But in general, we are predisposed to remember bad things, remember the painful things, the wounding that happened, and not to remember the nicer connections we have if we're talking about relationships. And so the metaphor that's always given is that, you know, we're kind of like Velcro for the the bad experiences and Teflon for the good. And then as we grow up, we end up having a nervous system that has a hard time with intimacy because we're very patterned in a way to detect what's going to go wrong and to protect ourselves. So I often call this the spacesuit self. So we're talking here what blocks love, that we get habituated and identified with our armoring, that it becomes such a pattern that it's so familiar, it's very, very hard for us to say, well, This defensive apparatus might have been necessary and useful then, but do I really need it as I'm engaging this moment? Very hard to do that. Very deep in our our wiring. I was listening to an NPR station some years ago in New York, and one of the stories, uh, little girls with her mother, mother's very busy, so she has a little girl painting, and she's comes to her mom and says, look, I mixed this and this, she mixed blue and yellow, and I came up with, you know, and she shows her, she, she discovered green, you know. And the mother said, that's, that's, that's wonderful, show your daddy when he comes home. Dad, Wall Street father, comes, com- comes in talking on his cell phone, and little Melissa says, daddy, I have to show you something, but he, he just goes right into his office. She's tagging behind him. He's kind of walking around the house on his cell phone, continuing whatever the process of deals or whatever. And she keeps saying, Daddy, Daddy, look at this, look at this. Finally, he's back at his desk trying to find something and she's tugging at his trousers and he's on the phone and looking around. And she's saying, Daddy, Daddy. And he said, Melissa, what are you doing down there? And she said, Daddy, I live down here. And it's sweet and sad 
because how many of us grow up feeling like in some deep way we can't trust that others are really interested in who we are, that we can't really trust that we matter or that we're important, that even, even when we have partners and families and so on, on some level there's that very deep insecurity that where we live and what's important to us, it's just, it doesn't matter so much. So that's one way that we grow up with that and then it becomes very hard to engage in a way where we feel spontaneous or we're willing to be creative with somebody or that we can really open our hearts because we're scared and defended. So we have this filter that gets developed and um, it happens in many different situations. For many people, parent is very critical or judgmental and we go through life expecting and tensing against other people in some way, reacting to us in the same way, right? Very often out of that insecurity there's, we, we hold very tight to our views and opinions. We have to be right because it's really dangerous to not be right. You know, that feeling of being wrong, it's really hard to live with. Have you ever been in an argument and three quarters of the way you realize that, that you really were not right <laughs> and how long you wait till you can admit it? There's a reason. I think it's always interesting. A little girl was talking to her teacher about whales and teacher said it was physically impossible for a whale to swallow a human because even though it was a large mammal, its throat was very small. And uh, so the little girl stated that Jonah was swallowed by a whale and irritated the teacher reiterated that a whale could not swallow a human. It was physically impossible. The little girl said, well, when I get to heaven, I will ask Jonah. <laughs> teacher asked, well, what if Jonah went to hell? And the little girl replied, then you ask him. (laughs) So it's a little bit of a silly example, but we hold real tight to our opinions and views. So I call this the trance of selfing sometimes when we're very identified with our spacesuit self, our sense of our ego. And the self is in here and the world's out there. And we're moving through trying to either prove ourselves or defend ourselves or in some way we have this agenda. And others become what I often describe of as unreal others. And it's because they're one of three things. Either they are an object that can possibly be a source for what we want and need like if I'm with you, maybe you'll, you'll give back some approval or money or time or energy or whatever we're wanting. Are there an object that's threatening, in which case we're, we're afraid of them or defending against them? Or else they're, they're neutral. They're, we, they don't matter. There's a kind of an irrelevance. Uh, one woman describes that she when she traveled, she came up with a really great uh, kind of a way to keep the seat next to her empty. And the way she'd do it, if anybody came by and asked, is someone sitting there, she'd say, no, no one, except the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just kind of a, kind of a manipulation. But then... The, the bottom line is that others are not real, so we're not relating to them as real. And we know that. We know when we're with people, we often either are projecting the, what we most don't like about ourselves, where that's what we're fixating on the other person, or else um, many times, uh, you know, that you're going to be, you're going to provide what I want. You've got something I want, and we don't really see who's there. It's really interesting um, when you think of the personals. You know, any of you that have done Match.com and you just see a little description and what you read into it. Here's one. Single black female seeks male companionship. Ethnicity unimportant. I'm a very good looking girl who loves to play. I love long walks in the woods, riding in your pickup truck, hunting, camping, fishing trips, cozy winter nights lying by the fire. Candlelight dinners will have me eating out of your hand. Rub me the right way and watch me respond. I'll be at the front door when you get home from work 
wearing only what nature gave me. Kiss me and I'm yours. Call 404 da 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 and ask for Daisy. Over 15,000 men found themselves talking to the Atlanta Humane Society <laughs> about an <laughs> about an eight-week-old lab. <laughs> It's good advertisement. <laughs> so we see, we begin to recognize that we have spent a lot of time, you know, creating these unreal others and that we get caught in the ways that we uh, defend ourselves. But it gets most interesting if we look right at today and say, well, how did I move through today? How much was I identified with my ego or my spacesuit? How much was I really available? So that's our next little reflection, if you will, just to take a moment. Let's bring it back right here to our lives. And I'd like to invite you just to reflect on several encounters you might have had Uh, today, yesterday. Just pick a few where you were with someone. Could be somebody very close or somebody not so close. But just let your way of scanning this encounter be notice if you were wanting to appear a certain way, to prove anything, if you were wanting to get something from that person? How did you want that person to experience you? If you were trying to avoid anything, if you are in some way tensing against any judgment, there was a self-consciousness. Perhaps if there was a neutrality or maybe you even were trying to get away, you wanted space and you were trying to wind your way out of something. If you were trying to get that person to be different in any way, or if you were fully present, not wanting anything different, attentive, available, appreciating. What was the quality of these interactions? as we deepen our, our longing and our commitment to waking up these hearts, this is the first step, is just without judgment, just to notice, well, what's my pattern? Is there an agenda? And you can uh, continue to just let that be an inquiry, something that you're interested in. Because if you add judgment to it, it actually locks you in some. If there's a gentleness and a curiosity in, in looking at, you know, okay, so what's my spacesuit or ego like? It actually gives you some freedom when you notice. Opening your eyes when you want. So we begin to notice that what blocks or overrides love is some agenda to push away, to get something, to impress, anything. To try to have that person be different, that's one of the big ones that prevents us from really fully just being with, it, with an open heart. What does allow love to flow, because many of us haven't done you know, deep heart trainings and meditations for years and years and yet love does flow, are the moments where we naturally arrive and we're not grasping or pushing away and there's an openness and we just are paying attention. Paying attention 
is the most basic and profound expression of love. In a moment that you offer attention, real attention, attention where you're just present and available, in that moment the heart naturally opens. So the most basic training in in awakening our hearts is mindful attention, just being there. There's a story of a a prisoner who lived in solitary confinement for years and uh, he saw, he didn't speak to anyone, meals were served through opening in the wall. Well, one day an ant came into his cell and the man contemplated it with fascination as it crawled around the room. And over the days and weeks to come, he'd hold it in his palm and just look at it and watch it move around and watch its patterns. And he gave it a grain or two of rice or whatever and um, kept it under a tin cup at night. Just That became his friend. And one day it really struck him that it had taken him 10 years of solitary confinement to open his eyes to the loveliness of an ant. That basic life, sacred energy that lives through ant. Krishnamurti says, if you take a stone, any stone, just from outside, just take it and just put it somewhere in your living room. And every day pass by that stone at least once and spend maybe 20 seconds paying attention to that stone. Within a few months, it'll become a sacred stone. Do you understand? That when we give our attention, that presence, that's a communion. We actually sense what's really there. We know it with our dogs and our pets. You know, I'm, I'm, it's always amazing that you, you can see all the dogs around and always lo- you know, love dogs, oh, what a nice dog, but your dog, <laughs> special, you know. There's, I mean, you know intimately the specialness of this dog that might look and be like many, many other dogs, but this dog is special. Do you know what I mean? We, we, we really, when we pay deep attention, whatever's there comes to life. It reveals its essence, its beingness and we cherish the beingness that's there. That's what we're in love with. It's the same beingness that's looking through your eyes right now. It's the same beingness that's listening. That's what we fall in love with. So we've all had the moments of attentiveness and what we find is that we can deepen it with mindfulness training and tonight we're going to do the last portion of the evening, how we deepen it with directing our attention in ways that arouse, arouse the heart. And it's classically called the metta, our lovely, loving kindness meditation. But there are infinite ways of doing a loving kindness practice because truly what a loving kindness practice is, is anything, any way you pay attention that has your heart feel more open and warm and tender. Any way you pay attention, using, your Im- using imagery, using words, how you direct your attention. Tonight we'll explore a classic version of it, but I invite you to experiment. In fact, I don't know anyone that has found real freedom on this path that has not purposefully paid attention to how to wake up loving presence, how to come home to loving presence. I couldn't do it without it, without feeling that, when I said smile into the heart and feel the space is there, if I didn't find ways to find more space and aliveness and tenderness right here, if there wasn't some gentleness, there's no way that I'd be able to pay attention with a a deep presence and be with what's here. We need love. We need love with each other. We need to know our belonging, truly know our belonging to each other and this earth and to all beings because that frees us from this delusion of this ego self. That frees us. So in the classic metta practice, there are two basic ways we're undoing our conditioning. And one is we're undoing that sense of separateness 
and we're widening the circles to include all beings because what happens, one of our illusions is even if we say, yes, I can feel love and connection, it's only with certain people <laughs> and it's with a certain circle of people. But we haven't yet examined how many different types of people or creatures or life forms in some way are still other. Racism goes so deep. Sexism goes so deep. Feeling a certain religion or a certain nationality or a certain age or a certain appearance that's not my type. We don't even know how quickly when we meet another person these categories flick through our minds and we have this very primal sense of my tribe and other. It just goes like that. It takes a devoted training to include all beings without exception in our heart. This is uh, Albert Einstein. He says, a human being is part of the whole called by us is part of the whole called by us universe. So we're part of that and we're part limited in time and space. We experience ourselves, our thoughts and feelings as something separate from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of consciousness. Okay, so he says we experience ourselves, our thoughts and our feelings as something separate from the rest and he calls it an optical delusion of consciousness. This delusion is kind of a prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from the prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. So we hear this same sentiment in Buddhism in the Metta Sutta, even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings radiating kindness over the entire world. So this is this beautiful practice and the way we do it is we begin with wherever it's easiest to wake up our hearts. So we start with someone that might be very close in, someone that's helped us, somebody that's um, dear to us. And we begin with that connection to feel the, the tenderness and the gentleness and the opening. And then we begin to widen the circles. And that we're going to do that in just a few, few minutes, just a few more pieces on this before we begin. It's the nature of love when it's wise love to ripple out. If there's some tightness in the love and some possessiveness in the love and grasping, it won't. It'll fixate just on a certain person. But if you think of someone you know who's truly a mature, loving being, if you have someone in mind like that, you'll sense that that person does not have only certain other people that are their special people and everyone else is, you know, out there. That heart is an inclusive heart. Isn't it so? Yeah. Story for you. Uh, this is told by a British writer, told of a, a, an experience that changed his life forever that happened when he was a student. He says, the police called at my student hovel early in the evening. I didn't answer because I thought they'd come to uh, evict me. I hadn't paid my rent in months. <laughs> and he says, but I got to thinking my mom hadn't been too good and what if it was something about her? I rang home to Leeds to find my mother was in the hospital and not expected to survive the night. So his dad said, come home right away. I got to the railway station and found I missed the last train. A train was going as far as Peterborough but I would miss the connecting Leeds train by 20 minutes. I bought a ticket home and got on it anyway. I was a struggling student and didn't have the money for a taxi the whole way, but I had a screwdriver in my pocket and a bunch of skeleton keys. I was so desperate to get home I planned to nick a car in Peterborough, hitchhike, steal some money, anything. I knew from my dad's voice that my mother was going to die that night. 
I intended to get home if it killed me. Tickets, please, I heard as I stared blankly out the window at the passing darkness. I fumbled for my ticket and gave it to the guard when he approached. He stamped it, but then just looked at me. I'd been crying, had red eyes, and must have looked a fright. You okay, he asked. Of course I'm okay. Why wouldn't I be? And what's it got to do with you in any case? You look awful, he said. Is there anything I can do? You get lost and mind your own business, I said. That'd be a big help. I wasn't in the mood for talking. He was only a little bloke, and he must have read the danger signals in my body language and tone of voice, but he sat down opposite me anyway and continued to engage me. Look, if there's a problem, I'm here to help. That's what I'm here for. I was a big bloke in my prime, and I thought for a second about physically sending him on his way, but somehow it didn't seem appropriate. I was a bubbling cauldron of emotion, and he had placed himself in my line of fire. The only other thing I could think of to get rid of him was to tell him my story. Look, my mom's in the hospital dying. She won't survive the night. I'm going to miss the connection to Leeds at Petersboro, and I'm not sure how to get home. It's now, it's tonight or never. I won't have another chance. I'm a bit upset, and I don't feel like talking. I'd be grateful if you'd leave, okay? Okay, he said, finally getting up. Sorry to hear that, son. I'll leave you alone then. I continued to look out the window at the dark. Ten minutes later, he was, at the ba- he was back at the side of my table. He touched my arm. Listen, when we get to Petersboro, shoot straight over to Platform 1 as quick as you'd like. The Leeds train will be there. I looked at him dumbfounded. It wasn't registering. Come again, I said stupidly. What do you mean? Is it late or something? No, it's not late. I've just radioed Petersboro. They're going to hold the train up for you. As soon as you get on, it goes. Well, everyone will be complaining about how late it is, but let's not worry about that on this occasion. You'll get home, and that's the main thing. Now, good luck, and God bless. Then he was off down the train again. Tickets, please? Any more tickets now? I suddenly realized what a top-class, full-fledged doylem I was and chased him down the train. I wanted to give him all the money from my wallet, my driver's license, my keys, but I knew he would be offended. I caught, I caught him up and grabbed his arm. I, or I just wanted to... I was speechless. It's okay, he said, not a problem. He had a warm smile on his face and true compassion in his eyes. He was a good man for its own sake and required nothing in return. I had to find some way to thank you. I appreciate what you've done. Not a problem, he said again. If you feel the need to thank me, the next time you see someone in trouble, you help them out. That will pay me back amply. Tell them to pay you back the same way and soon the world will be a better place. I was at my mother's side when she died in the early hours of the morning. Even now, I can't think of her without remembering the good conductor on that late night train to Petersboro. My meeting with the good conductor changed me from a selfish, potentially violent hedonist into a decent human being, but it took time. I've paid him back a thousand times since then. I tell the young people I work with, and I'll keep on doing so till the day I die, You don't owe me nothing, nothing at all. And if you think you do, I give you the same advice the good conductor gave me. Pass it down the line. So this is a training really in the freedom of the heart to express its naturalness, which is love. Certainly fear contracts us and pulls us back, but it's our capacity to awaken this love and really know it's home for us. It's home. So as I mentioned, the first part of the practice is we find where it's easiest to feel loving-kindness. Then we typically bring loving-kindness to ourselves because there is no way to awaken this freedom of the heart to love unless we love the life that's right here. No way. This life is part of the universe, part of nature. And many people will will say, well, isn't that selfish to be sending love and sending good thoughts and so on to our own being? But what we find, I usually say, find out for yourself, see what happens. Because in the moment that we send kindly thoughts to our own being, there's this atmosphere of caring. And it's not about a self. It's just we're waking up into caring. So we bring love to ourselves. And then we widen it out to someone that we care about, 
to someone that's perhaps neutral, we don't have any strong feelings, to a difficult person, and then to all beings. So that's what we're going to do. The main, uh, way, main way that we do this is by reflecting on goodness. Love is appreciation. We fall in love when we recognize that essential beingness, that essential goodness in ourselves and others. That's what wakes up love. And, and just a, a final word on um, when we're offering it to ourselves and we're looking for goodness, um, it's not like we're, we're, we're trying to convince ourselves we're a good person. It's not like that. It's like I sometimes think of that, that cartoon with a dog wearing a headset and he's listening to affirmations. It's called doggy affirmations and saying, you're such a good dog. Oh, you're such a good, good dog. Oh, you're such a good dog. And, you know, and he's listening to it all night long. Well, it's not like that. It's not like we're telling yourself you're a good person. You're a good person. It's deeper. It's feeling in our hearts the basic goodness of our being, this beingness. Let's practice together and we'll just speak a little bit in closing. So find a way of sitting, as you often do, that it allows you to be upright and awake, but be comfortable. Make sure you're at ease. Be kind with your body. As you come into stillness, you might come back to that image of a smile. It's a way to actually create the physical body of loving kindness, directly embodied. Just let the eyes soften, feel the smile through the eyes. Slight smile at the mouth. Feel a smile at the heart. And as I mentioned earlier, as you feel the smile spread through the heart, it's not to in any way paper over what's there. It creates a gentle space for the life that's here. Bringing to mind now someone that you might consider a benefactor, someone who is in some way given to you. And it, It could be a person you know personally or it could be somebody in this world that you consider a benefactor, healer, teacher or friend, someone maybe who believed in you or believes in you, someone who's been generous with their time or energy helping you out. And if it's not someone you know, someone who in some way you feel that person there for you in a more indirect way. It's ideal if you know the person so that you can just feel that person and their energy close up, feel some kindness that they've done and see if you can just receive the kindness. And if you find you can't let it in, notice that. Because anything you notice during the loving-kindness practice is useful. There's no particular way to experience things. Just seeing if you can let this person's care in and sensing the possibility of really taking in, taking in that person's goodness, registering the goodness. Sensing the, the caring that, that comes up in you when you just feel that person giving to you, that generosity. Love is an experience of appreciation. So feel that love to the extent you can. And we begin by offering just words of blessings to our benefactor. I'll just give some phrases that are quite simple and feel free to adjust them if you'd like. May you feel happy. 
Just imagine that person happy. May you feel filled with loving presence, held in loving presence. May you feel peaceful. May you touch great natural peace. Again, just to imagine this person peaceful. May your heart awaken and be free. You sense the possibility of this person with that realization and that freedom. Then we bring our attention to our own hearts and just to feel your own heart. Just the, the potential of and the, the essence of loving that's there. And we reflect on our own goodness. You might reflect on your different qualities of goodness. Maybe your honesty, maybe your humor, curiosity, that you have a commitment to waking up, to growing, to learning. I'd sense your basic being this, this deep att- intention in you, like what your deepest intention is, like what really matters to you, when you sense what really matters to you, perhaps to be loving, spiritual freedom, presence. You can sense your own sincerity, you can feel your goodness, just basic goodness. And if it helps to look through someone else's eyes at yourself, please do so. Someone that loves you or cares about you. It could be a grandparent or a child. It could be, imagine you're looking through the eyes of the Buddha or Jesus. It could be a friend that that really gets you. It could be your dog, just looking through the eyes of another and sensing your goodness. And as you feel that appreciation there, just see what happens when you offer yourself the blessings of loving kindness. And some people find that putting their hand on their heart is a beautiful part of the loving kindness practice, that you can feel that you're offering the words, but you can also feel the touch and the tenderness of the touch, and it can deepen the, the realness of the contact. So you just send these same messages, may I feel happy. Just imagine that. Feel the wish, the sincere wish. May I feel happy. And the care behind that. And the possibility of the experience. May I be filled with loving presence, held in loving presence. So you might imagine and feel that warmth and tenderness filling you, bathing you, emanating from you. May I touch natural and great peace, peace beyond all understanding, just to really rest in great peace. May this heart and mind awaken and be free. Sense the possibility of realizing this awake openness, this freedom that really is our essence, living from that realization. We begin to widen the circles by bringing to mind someone in our life that we care about, that we'd like to offer our loving prayer to. Just bring to mind someone, it could be your brother or sister or friend or partner or child, colleague, 
someone dear. And just see if you can imagine that person right here, right here with you. As you sense the person here in the room, very close in, just to imagine the person's eyes and see, look into those eyes and see what you love. You might be seeing that person looking lovingly at you and sense the heart that lifts through that person. You might see that person happy and and feel the goodness of their happiness. You might sense the person's humor, aliveness. Sense the beingness that's there. What you most appreciate. And as you tune in to what you appreciate, just to feel the visceral sense of your heart's connection, your care. And offering that person prayer the prayers of metta, the blessings of metta, may you too feel happy. As if you're putting your hand gently on their cheek, or their shoulder, or their heart, may you feel happy. Offer your blessing. May you be filled with loving presence, held in loving presence. May you feel my love now. Imagine that person feeling filled with loving presence, held in loving presence. May you touch natural great peace. Just imagine that, peaceful. And may your heart awaken and be free. May you be free. We continue to widen the circle of heart now to bring to mind someone, it's called a neutral person. This is someone you know that you don't have strong feelings in any direction towards. Perhaps somebody that you see when you go to a store somewhere or that you, um, it's a colleague at work but you just don't have that much contact or just where you just, it's not negative, it's not positive. See if you can locate a, a neutral person as they say and just let that person be here. And as you do that, look to see in that person the goodness. Sense how this person wants to be happy and doesn't want to suffer. This person wants to love and be loved. Just begin to sense that. You can sense the being that's there. Wants to love and be loved. As you begin to sense that, the real human, perhaps the, the, the humor that's in that person, the capacity for kindness or patience, creativity, the beingness, and to send your blessings. May you feel happy. May you be filled with loving presence, held in loving presence. May you touch natural and great peace. And may your heart and mind awaken. May you be free. Sensing the bond that happens when you begin to bring somebody into mind and pay attention. 
including now someone that's more difficult and not somebody that you have like a major anger aversion towards, but somebody that's just a little difficult, just a little for tonight. You can take on more difficult at another time. When somebody's very difficult and evokes really painful feelings, we begin by bringing compassion to our own hearts. We don't go right into metta for another person. But if a person's just irritating or just a little bit of a challenge, we can explore the metta practice. And one of the ways to do it as you bring this person to mind is to remember that this person wants to be happy. They're trying to find a way to be happy, to not suffer. It helps to remember that. You might have that in your mind. I know you want to be happy. You want not to suffer. This person wants to feel loved, wants to feel loving, trying to find their way. It can help to imagine this person is young or vulnerable. Sometimes if the person's really irritable, imagine them sleeping. <laughs> Or you can imagine somebody that's already passed, that they've already passed away. It helps to connect with beingness. But for now, just sense the person here and try out the phrases. May you be happy. May you be happy. May you feel happy. May you feel filled with loving presence, held in loving presence. Imagine that person feeling that. May you touch natural and great peace. Imagine that person really peaceful. And may your heart and mind awaken. May you be free. For the last part here, I'd like you to bring to mind your benefactor, first person you meditated on, and your own being, and a dear person, neutral person, difficult person. Have them all here. Just sense that your, your heart is including them all. And then sense this possibility of this edgelessness of heart that really extends in all directions. So you feel that you're holding the earth our mother in your lap and all beings in your heart. You can sense all the beings that are right here sitting with you or all the beings wherever you are listening to this right now that are in your near vicinity, all the beings on this earth, old and young, suffering and flourishing, all the creatures of all sorts, all beings on earth and beyond, included in this heart, this tender, caring heart. And so you offer your prayers to all beings everywhere. May all beings everywhere be happy. May all beings feel happy. And sense that possibility. May all beings everywhere be filled with loving presence, held in loving presence. May all beings know their very essence as loving presence. May all beings rest in great and natural peace. May there be peace on earth. May there be peace on earth. May there be peace everywhere. May all beings everywhere awaken and be free. (laughs) 